Okay, this video is in response to a question that one of my YouTube viewers had about, um, actually some ideas he had actually for a video. And this is uh, about how to use an oscilloscope to make some measurements on a transmission line like this hunk of coax I've got sitting here. So uh, maybe measurements like uh, you know, how long is that piece of coax or if there's a break in it, how far away is that break you know, down the, down the line so you can repair it, or even what its impedance is. And we can do all those things. Uh, with a scope and a simple pulse generator using a simple pulse like this. So uh, it's running at just uh, oh, uh, you know, 100 kilohertz or something like that, nothing too terrible. But you, want, you just want the rise time of the, of the pulse to be reasonably fast. Okay, and we'll talk about why in a moment. So uh, the signal as it tra travels down you know, a given transmission line doesn't go instantaneously, it does have a, a speed to it, and uh, we can take a look at uh, at that speed and uh, how we can derive that and, and use that to our advantage. Um, so basically, the, you know, we're, we're no, we don't quite run at the speed of light, right? The speed of light is uh, you know 186,000 miles a second, but kind of converted down to numbers we can use better. You got to think about it this way: saying uh, the speed of light in free space is just about a foot, just under a foot per nanosecond. Okay, but uh, because the uh, the, the dielectric that's used in the cable is not free space. Um, the speed of signals in wire is actually going to be a little bit slower. And uh, we use this factor called the velocity factor, which is essentially related to the dielectric constant. We use that velocity factor to figure out how much slower. So for typical coax, um, you're typically looking at about a 66% velocity factor, meaning that while in free space signals travel at 11.8 inches per uh, per nanosecond. In this typical coax it's more like 7.79 inches per nanosecond. So um, other coax types depending on the type of insulation might vary from about 0.6 up to about 0.85 but uh, you can get a good approximate uh, you know uh, value by using this. So, uh, so the signal essentially is going to travel down that line. And The other thing we're going to use to our advantage here is the fact that uh, Transmission lines you know, have a characteristic impedance, and, uh, and ideally, if that line is terminated in, in its characteristic impedance, the signal goes down, there's no reflections, and everything works great. Typically, if the line is not terminated in its characteristic impedance, you get reflections off the end of the line that work their way back. And you know, one way to think about this is that the transmission line can be thought of as a long distributed capacitor, right? Because it's just two, two conductors, the signal and ground that are separated by an insulator, so that's kind of the definition of a capacitor. So the capacitance is kind of distributed all the way across the line. And because the line is relatively long, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, series inductance that you can kind of think about there. So as the, you go to change the voltage at the input of the line to send it down the line, that voltage is going to cause a current to kind of go through the distributed in inductance and charge up the distributed capacitance as it works its way down the line. And as it's working its way down the line, you know, these two, you know, parameters, if you will, conspire to create a voltage and current relationship during, those tra during that transition. And that relationship is simply the characteristic impedance. So 50 ohm line means that as that signal is traversing down the line and changing, okay, the voltage and current at any instant in time until a reflection occurs and that kind of thing has got a 50 ohm relationship. So, uh... So what happens though if this line is misterminated, for example, if it's left open circuit, you know, that voltage that's pushing this current down the line, all of a sudden now that current has got a different impedance that it's looking into, uh, and, and therefore the voltage will rise up and reflect back. So you essentially get this signal that comes down here. Initially the signal looks like it's seeing 50 ohms, and then boom, it hits the end, it sees an open circuit. That voltage bounces up and then works its way back to the input again. So in the case of our signal generator here, we've got a 50 ohm output impedance, so that reflection comes back, hits the output impedance of the generator, and then dies there. So uh, we'll go take a look at that. So right now, I've got this uh, uh, signal coming into my scope. The scope is terminated into 50 ohms, so I get a, a reasonably clean square wave here. Now watch what happens if I take the termination and I move it from 50 ohms up to high impedance. So now at high impedance, you see the voltage is double in amplitude. I'm turn I've got this line, the signal coming into the end of the line here. So that's coming down here, hitting the open circuit, bouncing up to twice the voltage, and then working its way back. So since we're at the end of the line, that's all we see is that bounce. Okay. Now what, I'll, now what we're going to do is take our unknown length of coax that I have here, 
and if I connect it up to this, what's going to happen is the signal is going to see 50 ohms. It's going to see this little high impedance tap. I'm not going to worry too much about that. But it continues to see 50 ohms. It continues to see that until the signal goes all the way around this coax, hits the end, and then the signal doesn't see the 50 ohms anymore. So it bounces back from there. You get the reflection all the way back around the coax again. Works its way back to here where it's going to add to the original voltage that was coming through and then go back and die at the generator. So watch what happens now if I push this... Uh, this connector right on here, onto the T here, we can actually see that effect right on our waveform. So we can actually see the signal comes up, it reaches that original amplitude we had when we were terminated into 50 ohms, but then it stays there a while, but then it jumps up again. So what's happening is that that, that period of time when it stays here, that's the time when the signal is, is basically hit this point and is traveling around through this coax here, and bouncing back, and then when it finally comes back to here, uh, that's when we see the step come back up again. So that delay right there is the round trip delay through the coax. Okay, and we can measure that a couple of ways. I could, I could throw some cursors on here and try to make some measurements. You know, uh, you know, like this. Not all scopes have got cursors. You know, on that, but so it may not be so easy to do. Um, another way we can do this is a lot of the scopes will have a, a times ten magnification, so we can actually position ourselves in a different spot in the waveform. You know, for example, like right here, take a look at, uh, at that waveform. And what we want to try to do is recognize the fact that this rising edge here is really, this rising edge is, is coming from that. This is the initial rising edge coming from the signal generator. This is the rising edge, that same rising edge that was reflected off the end of the cable and came back. So we want to kind of find the same spot on the rising edges of each of those as our measurement point. So if we take a look at this, I'm running at, say, 10 nanoseconds of division. I can just count divisions over. So I've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Oh, well, about 76 nanoseconds or so. In fact, I could throw the cursors on here with this scope and actually take a look at that. So maybe right about there. And move this cursor over to here. And like I said, we're probably about 76 nanoseconds or so. We kind of, I kind of did this once here before. Um, so that's one, another way to measure it. We could also, you know, actually take the other end of the coax here and go into channel 2 with a scope and just measure the propagation delay between channel 1 and channel 2. That's another way to do it. So there's a number of ways to kind of figure out that propagation delay. The advantage of doing this open circuit way is that we're, we're actually doing a round trip delay, where if we connected one coax from one side, one end of the scope to the other, we'd only see, you know, one, you know, one direction, so this distance would be half, might be harder to measure depending on how long the coax is. So, so here this is actually our round trip delay, so that's actually twice the delay of how long it takes to go through the coax. So if we now take and use that formula here, we can say, well, I can take my measured delay, which we know is the round trip delay, we can multiply that by 7.79 inches per nanosecond, right, that cancels out the nanoseconds, that gives us the total round trip length in, in inches Okay, so the round trip length is, you know, uh, twice the distance, so we're going to do a divide by 2, and we're going to do a divide by 12 to put us in feet. And if you run those numbers on 76 nanoseconds, you'll wind up with about 24 and a half feet or so, and that's how many feet of coax I've got sitting here on my lap. Okay, so that's one thing that we can actually do, and measure, uh, you know, estimate the length of, uh, of the coax here by simply using, uh, using the scope and uh, looking at their reflection. Another thing we can do is figure out uh, the kind of get an estimate for the impedance of this, saying, well, let's let's match the impedance at the other end here. Okay, so if I got, uh, I'm going to stick the camera down here, and uh, so I could take uh, this end of this coax, and at this end I've created a little, you know, I'll put a little pot here that I soldered on the end of this little BNC connector, and if we stick that uh, right into the end of the coax here, okay, and I'll. Uh, Put this down here. Pick the camera back up here. So, uh, so now I can actually just go and twist this pot back and forth. And as I do that, we can actually see the waveform change on the screen. You can see if I make the impedance really low, my reflection essentially shorts the. Uh, the, the um, you know, I'm shorting out the uh, the signal at the end by dialing that pot down to zero. And all we see is that the signal lives for the 50 ohm duration and then dies. Okay. And then, uh, but uh, and then if we because uh, we've shorted the signal out, and uh, if I kind of work it the other way, I can see when the impedance is too high. I can't, you know, this this doesn't isn't as wide open as open circuit, so the reflection isn't quite as big. But if I 
dial this pot uh, you know, back and forth here until the signal is kind of flattened out, I could say, well, that basically mimics what the, the characteristic impedance is of the line. Okay, So I basically would just take this device off here and go measure it on my ohmmeter and estimate what the impedance is of the line. So it's good to try to figure out if you've got 75 ohm coax or 50 ohm coax or 93 ohm coax or whatever it might be. So, uh, so yeah, there's a couple of quick little tricks. I could use a scope and a simple pulse generator to uh, estimate the length of a, a piece of uh, unknown coax.